Hi everyone. Welcome to the MLTI 2.0 series, Recipes for Project-Based Learning. My name is Tracy Williamson, and in this episode, I'm welcoming special guests, my fellow ambassadors and educators, Eric Wade and Rob Dominic. Project-based learning is like running a restaurant, where your students are the business managers, architects, menu planners, wait staff, and chefs, all working together as a team to deliver a delicious meal to customers in the end. In this series, we're talking about just a few of the many ways to bring project-based learning into your classroom, along with some educational technology tools you and your students can use to enhance the experience. This week's episode of Recipes for Project-Based Learning is all about creating effective and engaging presentations when you take project-based learning to the community. Before we jump into some tips, tricks, and ideas, let's revisit the purpose of project-based learning and how it fits under the umbrella of interdisciplinary instruction along with the other PBLs, problem and place-based learning. Hello, my name is Eric Wade. I'm an interdisciplinary instruction specialist with the Maine Department of Education. This is a uh, short description of what interdisciplinary instruction is and how it connects to project-based learning. So interdisciplinary instruction is uh, it's all about the movement of uh, student learning from two-dimensional, where we focus just on skills and knowledge, to three-dimensional, where we focus on transferring those skills and knowledge, regardless of time, place, or situation. So basically that means that uh, we're looking to design uh, work, uh, lessons, activities for students, so that when they uh, learn that knowledge or uh, practice that skill, that they can then apply that to a new situation in another class or outside of the school day where they're confronted with a, a problem that they have to solve on their own. To do this, uh, we can think about it uh, in a couple different little ways. Um, first one is thinking about student dispositions, which are the behaviors and ways of thinking. Basically, it's what do we want our students to, uh, to be when they're older? What behaviors do we want to see in students as they mature and grow. So those are things like curiosity, tolerance, empathy, collaboration, courage. It's uh, using those dispositions, we can then build generalizations, which is a relationship between two concepts. So let's take the concept of access to fresh fruits and vegetables and student attendance, right? We're looking at a connection between those two concepts. That connection is what's called a generalization, which, uh, we would then look at, we would then use the knowledge and skills, which we'll talk about in a second, to uh, to look at how uh, an increase in healthy food choices leads to decreases in student absenteeism uh, and connects to successful student outcomes. So this is obviously a very broad idea um, and you may not use something like this with your students, but the idea is still the same. You start with a couple of concepts in your classroom, whether it be uh, you know, uh, food supplies and um, economy or whatever, it doesn't matter. And then you build a generalization between those two things. And you use the knowledge and skills that you uh, would do in your classroom, whatever your, whatever your standards are, whatever you're looking at uh, to, for, um, uh, that you have to teach in your, as part of your curriculum. And you use those to make the connection between that concept and that generalization. And along the way, you're using the dispositions to uh, to help students understand and grapple with uh, answering that generalization with evidence uh, in whatever way makes the most sense for your for your class. So, to connect this to project-based learning, project-based learning is basically um, an example of how you could do interdisciplinary learning. It helps us as teachers um, to plan to make a to, to build a design to build a unit so that we can uh, help students work through this process of interdisciplinary instruction because interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary instruction as a whole is a very broad topic so uh and there aren't like steps to it like you could find in a in a project-based uh format uh but you know it project-based learning is an example of sustained inquiry which is uh you know is is broken down into into kind of essential pieces that you can then plan for and you don't have to necessarily do them all at once right you can as a, as a beginning uh, of project-based learning if you just wanted to add 
one of those design elements into your class to extend student learning, to uh, increase engagement, whatever it was that you were doing, um, you could do that. You could just start with creating an authentic audience, uh, having your students present to an authentic audience in some way. And it can be a local one too. You could do, uh, you know, you could have a, um, uh, you know, have students write um, persuasive essays that they then uh, read to uh, administration in some way. Uh, you know, you're creating an authentic audience for that. It doesn't have to be a whole PBL model, right? The idea is, is that back to the interdisciplinary idea, the idea is, is that you're creating those dispositions and asking questions of students that involve first the big concepts and then those generalizations to uh, and then throw in an authentic audience or, or a reflection piece or student voice and choice, you add those in there and now you're starting to work on a, uh, a little bit more project-based version of interdisciplinary instruction. The PBLs of interdisciplinary instruction include place-based learning in which students are working with their community, school, or immersed in local history and culture, and problem-based learning where students learn by exploring solutions to an open-ended problem. When you take these and turn them into a long-term project, you have project-based learning. Students are exploring real-world problems through personally meaningful inquiry and connections and presenting their learning to an authentic audience. Portraying the essence of project work, the importance of the mission, and creating an impact can all hinge on how the project is all packaged and presented to the audience in the end. An impactful presentation is going to inform, persuade, entertain, and inspire an audience. I'm sure we can all think of presentations that we've experienced that did all of that and others that did not. When you think of some of the best presentations that inspired you, there's a good chance that they included a well-written and practiced script, topical and relevant humor, and had a visual combination of images, infographics, and video enhanced with just the right choice of music. As with any presentation, you want to start by having your students create an outline, describe the project from inception, include all the project design elements, write about the challenge or problem that initiated the project, the who's, what's, and why's that guided the inquiry process, and the conclusion or discovery as a result. Curate all the evidence and data collected into concise summaries including photo collections, video footage, graphs, and charts. Later in this video, MLTI Ambassador Rob Dominic will share some tips and resources for collecting, organizing data, and creating graphs and charts that students can incorporate in presentations. When getting ready for a public presentation, practicing in front of an audience is going to be important, especially if students have not had many opportunities to do this. It can be nerve-wracking. But with a lot of preparation, students will feel more comfortable in front of their audience and be able to deliver their message more effectively. Students should be sure to fully know and understand the content they are presenting. Create scripts, slides, and note cards. Encourage students to ask clarifying questions and be prepared to answer questions from the audience as well. It's a good idea to only use key points on a slide instead of reading a slide verbatim to the audience. Practice a lot. Practice for mock audiences, record both video and audio and listen back, and pay particular attention to any distracting extras. We all have moments when our brains and speaking aren't quite in sync, so when you're in a presentation, you want to speak slowly, take pauses to collect thoughts, to avoid extraneous ums, uhs, you knows, and other fillers that can distract from the message. A presentation can be just delivered via speaking alone, but it's always a good idea to add a visual component to engage the audience and highlight key points and moments. By utilizing things like imagery, typography, color, and the principles and elements of design, you can take any basic slide and elevate it to capture your audience. There are seven principles of art and design that lead to visually effective work. Utilizing these principles doesn't mean you have to be creating high art or professional graphic design. Just being aware when you create presentations can help immensely. The elements of art and design are the tools to use to accomplish the principles. Line, shape, space, color, value, and texture. Good use of the elements and principles of design will have a positive effect on the audience that will enhance the information being shared. 
Color choices are important in your visual presentation. Research has shown that colors have subconscious impact on viewers. Red gives a feeling of excitement, love, danger, or anger. Green is usually associated with nature, wealth, or jealousy. Blue can portray a feeling of calm, friendliness, or responsibility. Choose a color scheme for the presentation and use it throughout for unity. Adobe Color Wheel is a great tool for selecting color palettes that are complementary. Let's say your school color is maroon. Rather than making every element of your presentation maroon, you can quickly find a palette that will support maroon for contrast and variety. Typography is also very important in audience perception. There are so many interesting and creative font choices you can use, but a good rule is to stick with two that complement each other. Serif fonts typically support a more serious message with an element of professionalism, whereas sans serif fonts give a more casual feel. Pairing a serif font with a sans serif font can give distinction between overall important point and subtext explanation. Display fonts are really fun to explore and can be great for a title screen or even topic titles throughout, but should be used sparingly. Too much text on a slide will disengage an audience. Choose only the most important points and save the text for speaking. Finally, be wary of your color choices with adding text to slides. Even though two colors may be complementary, it's a bit of a different story when it comes to text on a background. Some color combinations can be very straining on your eyes. You don't want your audience to leave with a headache. Along the same lines, watch out for text on busy backgrounds. If you have a background that you really want to use and the text is hard to see, placing a simple shape behind the text can turn a potential eye strain into an effective visual. Here we have an example of two different slides. The first one is just basic. It's got information and a couple of images. And then the second one has the same exact images and message, but it's been transformed so that it's a little more visually appealing for an audience. So in order to get from here to here, here are some of the things that you can do. First of all, we are just looking at a plain white background here. So if we want something different in the background to make it a little more interesting, we have a couple of options. You can change the background here and you can upload an image or find an image online. But what I've actually done is I added an image to the background instead. Up here in my insert menu, I'm gonna search the web and I just had searched for recycling since this slide is about waste and recycling in school. And I found, by scrolling around, I found there were a lot of images that could have been used for a background, but I ended up finding an image of cardboard. So I inserted that to my slide, and it automatically filled up the entire slide. Now I don't want that to be in the foreground like that, I want it to be in the back. So if I right click, I go to order, I'm gonna send it all the way to the back. So already that slide looks a little bit more interesting. Now it's difficult to see this text here because it's small and the background is now darker. So I can change the transparency on this background. So if I go to my format options, I can just adjust the transparency so that it's a little bit lighter in the background. You still get that same textural effect, but the background is lighter. So I have to decide what I want the most important thing to be on this slide. And I think I want it to be this image here of the trash going into the bin. So I'm just gonna make this other one a little bit smaller. And I'm gonna take this image and put it right in the center. And then I want it to be a little bit more prominent. So I'm going to add a uh, border around the edge and I don't want that border to be orange, Let's make a black border. And then I'm gonna add a drop shadow. Drop shadow is kind of make things pop a little bit off of the page and you can adjust the distance if you want it to be a little more. You can adjust that angle so it looks like the light's coming from the side. So now I have this picture which is very prominent in the middle of the slide and that's definitely gonna draw the viewer's attention right there. I'm gonna take my recycling bin and put it 
off to the side and I want to put it in front of this picture. So I'm going to again go to order and bring that to the front. Next we've got this text here. So the text is just kind of put off to the side. It's like exactly where the text box appeared and the words were just typed in there. There was really not a lot of thought put into that. So I want this to be more like a title. So I'm going to put it in the center and I'm going to center a line and then stretch this text box out so that it all comes into one line. And then I'm just going to move that down a little bit. So we're already looking better here, but I don't really like this font. It's kind of casual looking. When I see this, it doesn't, I don't want to take this very seriously, this information. So I'm going to, I want to keep it a little bit fun because students are making this and it's school related, but I want it to be, seem a little bit more professional. So I'm just going to scroll through my fonts and find something that I would like to use here. There are a lot of different choices. And also, if you don't find what you want in this list, you can go to more fonts and there are just a ton of cho different choices. I'm gonna try caveat. I'm gonna make it a little bigger. I'm gonna bold that. And there we go. So we still have a similar effect to the other font, but this just looks a little cleaner. So I'm looking at this slide and it still seems, there's still a lot of space on the left and the right. So we can really frame this out by just adding a couple of shapes. So if I go up to the rectangle shape, and I could accomplish this with a line as well, but I'm just gonna draw a skinny rectangle and I'm gonna get rid of the border. I'm gonna change the color so that it kind of matches that green trash can there in the center and make it a little thinner. And I'm gonna move it just away from the very edge just for something interesting. There, so we have one line on that side. I'm gonna I'm gonna make sure that those are that's aligned with the edges of the slide. And then I could take this and I can just hold down option and click drag on my Mac and just drag another copy over here, or I could just do a normal like copy and paste. So there's that, and then I could do maybe another one and make this a different width for some variety. But notice I'm keeping with this same color scheme so that everything matches everything we have some unity going on here and then another frame across the top so i'm going to take another another rectangle and just draw one across the top and again change that color make it a little thinner and then bring one down to the bottom as well so I can keep playing around with this and I can make it a little more visually interesting without taking away from the message because we still want that picture and then the text to be the most prominent thing that the audience sees when we're speaking about this particular topic in this slide. So you can see in the end, I, I put a shape in the background. I added the drop shadow to the shape. I added a border so that brought that text out even more. I moved the recycling bin down so that it's kind of overlapping the border just for something visually interesting. Then we've gone from this rather basic slide to something much more visually appealing. There are lots of pre-made templates available that you can download and use in Google Slides, PowerPoints, and Keynote that have color palettes and fonts predetermined. Sites like SlidesGo, Canva, and Adobe Express can be a great starting point from which you can customize while staying within the provided design theme. To take things to another level and increase engagement and effectiveness for an audience, students can add animations to slides or create a video with added music to really tap into the audience's emotions. For a great tutorial on creating animations in Keynote and Google Slides, Check out Jonathan Warner's video, Digital Design 101, on the MLTI YouTube channel. All of the animations you see in my video series here were created in Keynote and then exported as video clips. Video presentations are the most effective way to reach an audience. Videos can be composites of photographs and video footage with embedded slides throughout. WeVideo and iMovie are both great tools for video editing. Either application allows students to compile images, video, voice recordings, screen recordings, and music. Students can use GarageBand or Soundtrap 
or the built-in voice recording features in the video app to record their script underneath the images. And finally, amplify the entire video product with music. Music has an incredibly powerful effect on an audience. Music in a restaurant, store, or played at an event subconsciously determines the mood of the people there and affects the energy of the room. Any DJ knows that they can make a group have the best time of their lives or start wrapping up and heading out just by playing certain music. By choosing just the right music, you can make an audience laugh, cry, have fun, or feel inspired to make a change. For example, this video clip gives a very different message just based on the music alone. There are some excellent sites like Incompetech, Purple Planet, and Ben Sound where students can find copyright free music to enhance their presentations. A challenging aspect of project based learning, and also a vital component of a presentation, is gathering, curating, and explaining the proof and evidence of the work done. My fellow ambassador, Rob Dominic, has some tips for helping students compile and organize data and turn it into visual graphs and charts to add to presentations for added impact. So we're going to be talking about various tools and resources that can be used for students to compile, curate, and present data. In Google Forms, I think one of the most important pieces is having students think about ahead of time what type of data they're collecting. Once they have that established, they have to also think about how do they want to present the data? Having those things flushed out ahead of time will help the efficiency of collecting the data and making the charts afterwards. So this was a social media survey that when I taught sixth grade, kids could choose various topics they wanted to survey and find information about throughout the, uh, the school that, in Brewer. And this student had picked a social media survey where they wanted to chart and see about the different social media platforms and who had an account in which service which app so they they conducted like this and they just decided to have the different categories and then a simple yes or no and there could have been some other ways that they did it they could have done which one do you have and had a multiple checks box and have them check off which platform they had and just have them check that off but when you use check boxes all of your data goes in a single cell this was the result on google sheets that we sent it to but if they had done check boxes they would have had like facebook and then comma instagram and then how um, Twitter all in one cell. This was laid out a little bit easier for them to calculate when they did a yes, no, right? As it showed up on here, it now has the responses tab where they come up with graphs on their own. If, if students just need this pie chart and that's it, that's great. What if they want all of these social media apps and resources in one chart? So that's one benefit of going to here where they can view responses in sheets. So I've already have I've already made a sheet where this goes to, but if there wasn't one already made, then you would have the option right here to create a new one. And then that would basically show up just like this. It would, this is exactly what it would be. How can you make the data look appealing for viewers? Having a bunch of data, a bunch of numbers, tables, expansive tables like this, where there's a lot to look through, that's not very fun for people to look at. So you want to you want to simplify it for them. And that's the beauty of using charts and graphs. So if I highlight this column and I go to insert chart, most of the time, Google is smart enough to be able to know what you want and how you want it to look. So right here, again, pie chart does make sense, which is exactly what we saw when we were at the form itself. Google does allow you to get a little bit more detailed with things. And if you wanted to, you could change it. You could change it to a column chart. You can mix it around as needed. A line chart doesn't really make sense in this case. Another great conversation to have with students, you know, line chart kind of charts over time. So just comparing qualitative answers of yes and no doesn't really help there. So we'll go back to here, but you can still edit it as needed, right? If you wanted to change the, the 
border color or the pie chart itself. You know, if you wanted it with that donut hole in the middle, there's customization that happens there. Do you want a border color to it? All right, to have that black rim around it if you wanted to. All kind of depends on your own aesthetics about what you want to talk about in class as far as presentation goes. Titling it, they need your your legend, your keys here on the side to make sure you know what you're talking about and the labels that go along with it. Also, the other thing that you can do with this is if you click on a section, it will take you to the, that edit area on the side here. But let's say you wanted to compare them. Let's say you wanted to have two of these, like Facebook and Instagram, next to each other. In my mind, if I'm comparing two items on a chart, I'm thinking a bar chart because then I can see the height of one and the height of another. You could think that, hey, I'm going to highlight then Facebook and Instagram, these two columns. I'm going to insert chart. But it, there's nothing that comes up initially. And if you think about it, it's just too much data for the, the computer to handle right away. It doesn't know exactly what you want. Right. In my mind, I'm thinking column of yeses for Facebook, a column of yeses for Instagram, so I can see the popularity and compare them. You could play around with the different types of charts and maybe one of them will come up with what you want. In reality, what's happening here is this, the, the data is not as organized as it should be to, to make that happen. And that's where down here, the counting of the yeses actually came in handy. So if I want to compare the yeses, and nothing came up for that chart, I'm going to simplify it. I'm going to say, all right, I'm going to call this the Facebook yeses, and this one will be the Instagram. Now that I have the data simplified, now if I highlight this and go to insert chart, it will know better about exactly what I want because, you know, I've done a little bit of the work for it, and I've simplified. Now, if I wanted yes and no's, I could start playing around with that. But for right now, I just want to be able to compare these two next to each other, and I have that. I can continue on and I can include Twitter and Snapchat, etc. on this and have multiple bars. But this is what I want. This gets the job done. And if I wanted to edit things, kind of appropriate that Facebook is already blue, uh, you know, with its uh, coloring. So that's fine. If I wanted to change it, work on Instagram, I could change the color, right? The, the labels, if I wanted to have a, you know, a number on here for them data labels i could have the exact number show up in here there's lots of options that come on here and again you can always just click on a a part of the chart and it will give you that part to edit over here so if i wanted to change change this uh vertical axis the y-axis i could click on that um and it could right if i want that on the side i can start editing it what do i want the um the steps to be do i want to go up by fives do i want to go up by ones that can all be played around with on here. The labeling can be played around with, all right? So usually, again, it's it's pretty smart that it can come up with what you want, as long as you have the, the pre-thought as to what data you want to use and how you want it organized. You do have to come up with that on your own to make it effective. So now that we have that, right, putting this in a presentation is actually pretty awesome. I literally just have to copy this. No, edit that, right? If I right-click, I only get this. So I'm going to press... Control C to copy it. And then I'm going to go to a presentation in Google Slides, press Control V, and I'm going to paste it in. Now it asks me, do I want to link that chart to that spreadsheet or do I just want to paste it like an image and it's just on its own? Most of the time, if I'm going from a spreadsheet to a, a Google Slide deck, then I'm going to say, click, uh, I'm going to have it linked to the spreadsheet and click paste. And you can see now that it's linked. This will live update now. Um, the other option, which has become a great piece as well, is actually using Canva. Canva is expanding tremendously and has come up with quite a few new design options. So on Canva here, with your options here on the left, you can scroll down, and I have it right here already in charts, but if you don't have it, you can always add more things through the apps and you can see them appear through here. But what do you want? What kind of external or side program do you want to run in Canva? In this case, I just want charts to show you. So similar to what we just did, there are a variety of charts that you can use. You can have these vertical bar charts, you can have the horizontal bar charts. You can change it once I have it in here. I'm like, no, that's not exactly what I wanted. I wanted a line chart or a pie chart. All of these options can be fit 
in this in this uh, Canva document here. Now that you have it there, though, if I click on it, this is where I can edit. It gives me a table that I can edit. And again, it, the the advantage of this is how simple it is. It's pretty. It's simplified compared to potentially too much data, too many options on the Google customization of a chart, right? Where there's a lot of options, which can be helpful. But if you're just talking about something simple for students, this could be it. So if I'm in here on this table, I can, if I delete a row, you can see it deletes a section on here. I can edit on here and I can say, we can go with a similar idea of what we had before. A yes and a no. And we'll just throw in a maybe just to keep that third category there. And then I can edit the numbers on here. Let's say there is 15, and then there is 5, and then there is 9. You can't edit these as much. Like, there's no title that ha that is incorporated on here. You can make that separate in Canva with its editing options, right? When you insert text and things like that, you can put that there where it belongs instead of editing it from here. I can edit these labels, but I cannot edit the, the title or anything else. I can change the color scheme with this up here. It kind of chooses the other supporting colors as you go. So you'd have to kind of be mindful of that. Like this, the, those blues to me aren't separate enough. Or maybe they're purple, colorblind. See, that doesn't work for me being colorblind there. So I need something with a little bit better contrast. You know, this the original kind of turquoise one isn't too bad. I'd have to play around with that to see, uh, you know, what's the best. The other options though, besides just editing this table here, which has its, again, it has its benefits. You can change it from percentages to numbers and you can turn the labels on and off. But if you had data, let's say right here, tracking YouTube views on a chart, there's a you know program that, that will automatically put this into a Google doc or a Google sheet for us. And we can kind of track over time and see how it looks. Let's say I want to use this data but I want to use it in this Canva. Let's go down here. I want to use it in this Canva document. Well, it works similar to slides with the Google Sheet pasting in that we had, except here, all right, I'm gonna use a, a line chart because I know that's gonna make the most sense because I'm tracking views over time. So I don't want this. So I'm not gonna mess with that actually. I'm just gonna to go to Google Sheets. I could upload a CSV, which is a comma, comma separated values, which is really just, it's a spreadsheet that you can download and then upload. That's, that's one of the ways that they are um, downloaded is through CSVs. But Google Sheets integrates perfectly already. So I'm going to, here, incorporate the data from this YouTube views. Now it shows me my document and then it shows me the different tabs on that document so youtube views is fine but now it does want what columns am i looking at so i go into my sheet i want the date and the views so column d column f so i'm gonna go column d1 column d1 through f5 i click update there it goes it changed it which is great because in between D and F is, of course, column E, which is part of the MLTI channel. And it didn't even recognize that. There was no issue with that at all. It, it took the numbers that it, it knew I wanted. So that was great on its part. So here's my chart. And again, similar piece. I do have some settings that I can edit. Not a lot, but there are a few that I can edit. I can add my own title. Again, if I wanted to, I could just kind of white out these pieces with a, a blank white box that's filled in and then get rid of pieces that I don't want. And then I can add my own text or my own pictures or things like that. And it does auto, well, not auto update, but it does have the option to update if something changes. So if one of these views really, you know, ends up being 75, not that I have to type this in myself because the computer automatically does it, but just to show you that this will change, if I click update, it will change here, just like on Google Slides. So I'll go back and change that because it will automatically fix itself anyways. So that's another great way. And it, it's, it is much simpler than, right, bar chart, 
kind. I mean, it kind of works, but not great. It's much simpler than the uh, Google Sheets option, just because there are less ways to get lost in it. So it, it is pretty useful for students to use to see, you know, scatter chart doesn't really make sense in this case, but it's great conversations for them to decide what chart works best, why it works best, which option do they want? Do they want to go more in depth with Google Sheet chart? Or do you want to send them towards more towards Canva where they can kind of create in a simpler way the chart that they want and just use this table to enter the information in? So hopefully those are two very useful ways that you can uh, use with your students to organize and curate data for them using the Google Forms to uh, collect the data, the Google Sheets to organize it, possibly make your charts and insert that into your Google Slides, which is really seamless. Or you can also jump over to Canva, um, which has its own benefits as well. With their data organized into easy to share charts and graphs, supporting images, aesthetically designed slides and video with music to enhance the message, your students will be ready to bring their project-based learning to the community to make a difference. If you have any questions about creating effective presentations or would like some more ideas or support with your students' presentations, please reach out to me at tracy.williamson at maine.gov or any other MLTI 2.0 ambassador. Visit the MLTI website for contact information and more. At the bottom of this video, you can find the accompanying slide deck full of resources as well as a link to complete a feedback form and earn contact hours towards recertification. Thank you for watching.